Hey, good morning, everyone. It's Tuesday morning. I need to uh, just quickly apologize for yesterday. Um, I was actually out um, doing a, uh, or picking up some uh, supplies that we needed for church for um, the baseboards we're installing and uh, totally lost track of time when I was gone. Actually, I was gone for a while. Um, so apologize for not getting on yesterday. Um, but we're back in it today. John chapter uh, 13, where we're left off last week, and we're going to dive into uh, just what the scripture has to say for us today. Um, really interesting things that Jesus says. Now, I think it's important we set the context here in, in which this all falls. Uh, John 13 uh, through John 17 all takes place um, uh, on the night that Jesus is going to be betrayed. So this is like Thursday night of the Passion Week. We call it the Passion Week, but the last week of Jesus' life on earth before his crucifixion. Uh, it's Thursday night. It's the Passover fi uh, meal. All that kind of stuff is going on. This is a, a big event. Uh, Jesus, um, as they're sitting down at the meal, Jesus washes the disciples' feet in John 13. We're going to see that Jesus teaches the disciples in 14, 15, and 16. Uh, they, they travel to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prays. It's just really this amazing thing that takes place in these next couple of hours, really, that night. Um, and so Jesus washes the disciples' feet. All those things go on. We know that Jesus then dismisses Judas um, to go and do his thing. I find that really interesting. Now, John doesn't record this, but, uh, but the other gospel records will record this, that after he washes the disciples' feet and all that was going on that evening, um, uh, Jesus institutes communion. Now, I think this is really important that we recognize this. This is a, um, and it's not a judgmental thing. This is simply just an interesting dynamic of the relational aspect that Jesus invites us to. Is that Jesus on that night, um, he washes the disciples' feet. They're all there for that. Everybody's there for the disciple for the washing of the feet. It means he washes Peter's feet, John's feet, but he also washes Judas' feet. We looked at that last week. I think that's powerful, right? That, that we should serve everyone. But then Jesus dismisses Judas, and then he institutes communion, right? This the Lord's Supper, this this last supper that he has with them. Uh, he talks about he won't eat of this again until the the kingdom of God comes, the, the new covenant. Um, so there's a special bond, right? Communion, and I'm not saying that communion is necessarily exclusive. Uh, but there's a different level of intimacy with that, right? That we're remembering Jesus and his sacrifice. We're remembering what he has done for us. So, um, so that's just an interesting take on that. So in John chapter 13, near the end of the chapter, verse 31, Jesus says, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. Uh, if God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will not. I will be with you only a little longer, Jesus says. You will look for me, and uh, just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my, my disciples if you love one another. I wanted to stop right there. This is such a, a profound statement. So Jesus not only washed his disciples' feet, right, um, and, and tangibly laid an example before them, right? Uh, he does go on later on and says um, in verse 15, he says, I've set you an example that you should do as I have done. So he said, I I'm not telling you to do something I'm not done. I'm not done. I've served, you serve. I came to serve mankind. You serve mankind as well. And what he says right here in the end of this, in verse 35, he says, by this, right, by loving one another, um, everyone will know that you are my disciples. So the evidence, the evidence of our allegiance to Jesus isn't, this is really interesting, isn't just church attendance, right? It isn't how many Bible verses you know. It isn't all those exterior pseudo markers of our faith. That's not what, that's not what gives evidence to our faith. Which is really interesting because Jesus lived in the in the first century, in the Pharisaical reign, um, with all these 
Pharisees and Sadducees, these religious leaders, that the dominant position they took on spirituality was by works. It was by how did you come to the temple on time? Did you pay your tithe? Did you, uh, did you memorize these scriptures, right? It's very, very internal focused on the certain um, evidential markers in our life of uh, disobedience. Um, and when Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus is not discrediting that. He's not saying we shouldn't do good things. He's not saying we shouldn't have that. But he says, you will be known. Everyone will know your allegiance to me if you love one another, right? That you bless one another, that you serve one another. See, the, the Pharisees were all about things that, um, that, that benefited them. Jesus is saying, no, we show our love for Jesus by the way we serve other people and we bless other people. We think about how that plays out in our life. Um, are we known as servants? Are we known as generous people? Are we known as people who bless others with our life? Uh, are we known by that kind of love? So in John, uh, 1 John chapter 3, John was writing to the believers. In verse 16 of 1 John 3, he says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. So he's talking about what is love. We're, we're identifying what love is. He says, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and truth. So there's some merit to this idea that when Jesus says you love one another, there has to be some evidence behind that. There has to be um, these evidential um, moments that we make decisions and we do good and we serve others, we bless others, we sacrifice for others, that has to be evident. Is that true of our life? Is that true of your life? Is it true of my life? Is there evidence of our love to one another? Uh, what, have, what have you done in the last month that has been a blessing, that has met a need for another family, another person? Uh, in what way have you come alongside of them and carried their burdens? Those one another passages, love one another, serve one another, forgive one another, pray for one another. Uh, are we doing those things in Christ? That is the evidence of the love that we have. Second thing that happens here is he goes on in this story. Um, and Simon Peter said, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus says, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. And Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Now, remember this. This is Peter. Peter's saying, Thursday night, he's saying, Lord, I don't care where you're going. If you go and if something happens to you, I'll defend you. I'll fight for you. I'll lay my life down for you. Peter says that. Now, we have to, in our mind, think to ourselves, wait a minute, I know the story about Peter, right? Peter's going to deny Jesus three times. And we normally knock Peter for this. We normally give Peter a, a bad rap because he betrayed Jesus. He lied about knowing Jesus. But that's normally what stands out. What I think sometimes doesn't stand out in this story is, so what we know is that when the, the uh, and we'll see this in chapter 18, that when the uh, mob of people come to arrest Jesus, what does Peter do? Peter pulls out his sword and he starts hacking away at people, right? Um, and we kind of laugh about that um, because Peter, obviously, wasn't very good aimed because he ends up cutting an ear off instead of a head off. Uh, Jesus actually tells him to put his sword away. Um, and that's get, we get, sometimes we get lost in that dynamic of what took place there. But do we realize what Peter was really doing, right? Because on one hand, I read Peter say this. He says, Lord, I'll, I'll lay my life down for you. And then I, and my, my first initial thought is always, Peter, you, you denied Jesus in front of like 12-year-old girls. This little girl that was asking you about Jesus, you, you lied and started cursing about it because you didn't want to be associated and, and you were fearful of your life. How can you say you would lay your life down? But he was willing. I mean, to pull your sword out and go fighting against hundreds of men that are there to arrest Jesus, that was pretty much a death sentence that Peter had. So I think it's important we don't knock people um, uh, all the time for their uh, quote-unquote lack of faith because Peter was willing in many regards to do whatever it took to defend Jesus. Um, so I just think that's an important thing. Um, 
it does tell us that Peter did deny. I mean, Jesus actually said that in verse 38. He says, will you really lay down your life on me, Peter? Uh, very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. So we know that three times he disowned Jesus, he betrayed Jesus. Um, but I love that that story is in there. I love that the story of Peter is in there. Um, that, right? When God put the scriptures together, he didn't hold anything back. He didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't make it look real pretty like, hey, these guys are perfect people and had it all together and never made mistakes. No, it shows blunders and sins and selfishness all alike. And it, it lays it out all in there. What's beautiful to me is the story of grace that this, um, that this picture gives. Because we know, and we'll read this later in John, we know that eventually, even though Peter denied Jesus three times, it was a horrible thing, um, Jesus restores him, right? Um, there's a repair in that relationship. There's trust that is given again to Peter to lead the church and incredible things he did. And so I just love that picture of God's grace in that day. Even when he messed up, even when he blew it big time and betrayed Jesus, there was still grace given to, to, to Peter uh, and that didn't disqualify him from being a servant of God and doing great things. So think about that in your own life and um, what that means to you as you serve uh, the Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. I thank you for all these different things we see in the scripture. I do pray, God, that we would genuinely love other people. And that love would not just come out in the way we speak to them, but God, in how we treat them and serve them and bless them. I just pray, God, you would give us um, a passion to do those things for you. I do pray, God, you'd give us zeal to stand up for you, that we would that we would mean what we say and we would do what we say. And um, if we claim allegiance to you, God, that people would see that in the way we live. Help us to do that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, hope you have a good afternoon. Thanks for joining us this morning. We look forward to seeing you back tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. All right, God bless.